The structure that would become the cathedral dates back to pre-war times. Before the Great War, it most likely belonged to vault -Tec, who built a vault beneath its foundations. It was a fully functioning demonstration vault, never intended to be used as a fallout shelter. But when the bombs came, many people living in the area knew where it was, and they managed to get inside and seal the door before the city was destroyed. Fifteen years later, survivors emerged and went their separate ways, while many vault dwellers stayed behind and continued to use the vault. But in 2155, vault dwellers on a supply run were captured by mutants, taken to Mariposa and dipped in FEV, and the resultant mutants were superior in every way. The master, the leader of the mutants, discovered that the reason for their higher being was due to their limited radiation exposure, and now, seeing how useful they were, he wanted more Vault Dwellers to further his Unity project. He wanted to create a new race from humanity using FEV. He believed, by ridding humanity of its differences, they would have no reason to fight, which in turn would bring peace and prosperity to the Wasteland. After some searching, he discovered the LA Vault, along with many more subjects, and after their transformation, he decided to make the vault his new command center. And the cathedral above, while too exposed for mutants, made the ideal location for his human followers, cultists who were rebranded as the children of the cathedral. They were the religious branch of the Unity, a widespread personality cult the Master established as both a cover for his activities and to spread his philosophy. The organization was managed by Morpheus, who acted as the public face of the Unity, while his underlings infiltrated wasteland settlements and recruited potential converts. Now the children were first encountered and captured in 2152 by scouts from the Master's army, but instead of being turned into mutants, the Master saw the benefit in establishing a benevolent religion to spread his doctrine. These cultists became his advocates and fifth columnists working behind enemy lines, and they did this for four years before moving to the cathedral, where they became officially known as the children of the cathedral. Missionaries slowly spread out across the wasteland, gathering information and sending it back to the cathedral, along with new recruits. In time, the children slowly transitioned from simply spouting gospel to running full-time clinics and hospitals, and the services they rendered to those in need was a fraction of the cost of what others charged, and this quickly earned them a reputation as a decent group of people, and more often than not, those who used their services joined their cause. But what did the children actually believe in? Well, the children had three core beliefs. The first was the nuclear weapons that scorched the earth were holy, for they destroyed the evil and decadence of the old world. The second was that human nature was inherently flawed. It made humans spiteful, violent, and stupid, leading to a self-perpetuating propagation of evil and greed, which always ended in conflict. The third and final belief was the rebirth of the planet could be achieved by accepting the master, by following his light, being selfless, and merging all people under a single banner, regardless of their race, gender, or other personal traits, the Unity promised to give them a better life. And their flower reminds them of this promise, a Unity rose, its color representing the holy flame, peace, and harmony, but very few children knew exactly how this Unity was to be achieved. Now the only group suspicious of their true intentions was the followers of the Apocalypse, who observed that those who didn't exactly agree with the children's beliefs frequently disappeared. Those who didn't mysteriously vanish became initiates, and they were expected to spend several weeks fasting and meditating until an elder decided that they were ready to join the faithful. And once they had officially joined, they were expected to keep their minds healthy and pure, so no alcohol or chems, but in return for their service and discipline, they were given clean water, food, and a safe place to sleep. All of the lesser members, the initiates who had proven their loyalty, were collectively referred to as acolytes, and any acolyte who continued to serve the cathedral was eventually given the chance to become a servitor, 
and I say chance because there was no guarantee they would actually pass the test. Once their indoctrination was complete, they were taken to the inner sanctum and subjected to drug injections and torture. The procedure was meant to push their minds to the breaking point upon which they would solidify their loyalty until death. Those who survived with their psyche intact were granted the appropriate rank of servitor and given purple robes. Those who didn't pass had their broken minds filled with cathedral dogma and became soldiers and laborers, many of which can be seen at the cathedral, shuffling from room to room in a zombie-like trance while completing their basic tasks. At the head of the cult stood the inner order, those with clearance to enter the tower or inner sanctum atop the cathedral, which consisted of Father Morpheus, Father Lasher, the second in command, Elder Jane, the head of the hub hospital, and ten other high priests. These high priests acted as agents of the second holy flame, passing his word to the rest of the children while overseeing the expansion of the cult. Now most members didn't really know how the master was going to achieve this unity, only that by following his light it would happen. But those who progressed far enough in service were able to learn firsthand some of the means through which the unity would be brought into existence. The servitors, those with purple robes, were inevitably taken to Mariposa and transformed into mutants. And these mutants, in the eyes of the children, were better than any other mutant, because they had been born from humans that were free of vice, and as such, they were considered to be gods. But to keep their true intentions secret, mutants were generally considered abominations when conversing with non-believers. While these core beliefs are the foundation of all their doing, the cathedral granted a lot of freedom in the interpretation of its core tenets, with most high priests developing their own doctrine. Take Morpheus, for example, who only does what the master asks and nothing more, and there's a reason for that. Morpheus was once a member of the Rippers, an ultra-violent gang from the Boneyard. Morpheus spent a decade with this gang, which shaped him into a violent and selfish man. But he was also cunning and intelligent, and he wanted power. Power the Rippers could not provide, which is why he left and started his own cult. That, on all accounts, was probably a good idea, as the Rippers were eventually wiped out by Deathclaws. But by creating a cult, the same cult that became the children of the cathedral, Morpheus gets to be all-powerful, living in luxury atop the cathedral and looking down on the rest of humanity. And it's this power that keeps him loyal to the master because he doesn't want to lose what he has. Which is why, despite not believing in their cause, he gives regular sermons and paints vibrant pictures of a better world all in effort to convince the children that their role as messengers of evolution and healers of the land will bring them better lives, because that is what the master wants them to believe, while Morpheus simply enjoys the power his position gives him. Other high priests are more selfless and have more practical approaches in their doctrine. Elder Jane echoes Morpheus's doctrine while offering a concrete road to this better life. She proposes that the children can accomplish anything through persistence, and a life of satisfaction can be attained by working for future generations. By rebuilding the planet and making it a better place for the next generation, they will have a better life. And while a peaceful solution is preferable, bringing others into the fold without violence, in the absence of superior methods, any who resist the unity are destroyed with militant crusades and projected as mere obstacles to the children's cause, which justifies her violent actions, as no struggle comes without a price. And then we have Father Lasher, who focuses on personal development, he believes that dipping humans in FEV doesn't make a difference, as every birth is a mutation of parents' DNA. Therefore, everyone is already a mutant. What really matters is that people are guided on a moral and productive path, and he believes that this productive path can be achieved through pain, the most instructive force in the universe. 
the faithful are to be broken and then remade into tools of the master's will. Enduring pain purifies the mind and prevents decadence, while those who succumb to the pain and die are necessary sacrifices. However, Lash's philosophy doesn't focus on simple endurance of physical pain. Righteousness is also attained through struggle, trauma, and recovery until one accepts the master's truth without hesitation. Pain is, in Lash's eyes, knowledge, wisdom is obedience, and service is courage. Besides the extremes of pacifism, militancy, and enlightenment through suffering are more moderate beliefs. There's Sister Viola, who has a more utilitarian philosophy. She accepts the apocalypse as a fait accompli, something that must not be dwelled on, but accepted. The Great War was the result of a dissolute and fragmented world that rejected peace and unity. So by using the facts and learning from the past, unity is the only way forward. And as promised, for following the second holy flame, the children have enjoyed a high quality of life. The cathedral, the heart of the unity movement, was clean, stocked with food, water, and medicine. It had its own generator, working electricity, computers, and comfortable quarters for the highest members of the organization. Furthermore, the protection provided by Nightkin was simply unrivaled. So for many years, the children continue to spread word of the master. They provided medical aid to the weak and sick and converted hundreds of people to their cause. Those people became devout followers, some of which managed to reach the level of servitor, going on to be dipped in FEV and considered gods. But no one was as holy as the master, the true leader of the children, and the one who would bring peace and unity to the world. But despite their efforts and loyal service, the children were ultimately destroyed by the Vault Dweller, and the Master and the Cathedral were all consumed by nuclear fire. The surviving children fled their hospitals and joined the remnants of the Unity in their retreat across the wasteland. Some of the children made it as far as the Den in later years, but the adjustment, without an elder to guide them, was too difficult and unable to bear the death of their master, they took their own lives. I'm sure some of the children, say the newest members for example, were able to return to a normal life, while others, the servitors and much more devout followers, held on to their beliefs until the very end. But without guidance, they were unable to become the powerhouse they once were, and by 2281, the children of the cathedral have ceased to exist. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything else you'd like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you, as always, for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure.